Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. And today we're joined by Dr. Cheryl Kinney. She's an obstetrician gynecologist in Dallas, Texas, and the director of the Center for Female Health and Hormone Disorders, and is a recent member of the North American Menopause Society Board of Trustees. So glad you could join us today. We're talking about something that we often don't talk about at all that I'm so fascinated about. So thank you for coming today. Well, thank you for inviting me. So what we're going to be talking about today is vocal changes in midlife women. And that's something that I can tell you in primary care, I never address with a patient. So firstly, tell me why does it happen and how often does it happen? So first of all, a lot of our menopausal patients attribute it to age rather than anything else. And vocal changes can be from other illnesses like hearing loss or viral infections, as we saw during the pandemic. They can be from reflux. Uh, they can be from medications, uh, but and they can be age-related. But especially in the ear, nose, and throat uh, otorhinolaryngology literature, this has been well studied. And the voice-related changes that occur with age are very distinct as opposed to the voice-related changes that occur with menopause. Uh, we also have data from young women with primary ovarian insufficiency who develop the exact same vocal changes that postmenopausal women do, as well as other young women who are put in hypoestrogenic states from chemotherapy or radiation, uh, they will also get these kind of vocal changes. And then we have the opposite end of that spectrum where you have some older postmenopausal patients who will maintain their vocal quality, but it is because they have a high BMI and their peripheral adipose tissue, finally fat is good for something, uh, will <laughs> convert uh, sex steroids into the weaker estrogen estrone, but if you've got enough of it floating around, it'll help keep your voice um, healthy. So, to answer your question, um, the vast majority of menopausal women will have experienced some vocal change, but for most of us, it's nothing more than a nuisance. I mean, we may get a little bit of deepening of the voice. We may have a little bit of a more raspy sound quality. And in some professions like ours, it gives us a little bit more gravitas. We also can have a little bit more vocal fatigue. But for elite voice professionals, people who use their voice all the time, like you, even small vocal changes can have a profound impact on a woman's career. So for most menopausal women, it's a nuisance, but for some women, it really can be impactful as far as their career. So is it just the deepening of the voice or are there other changes too? So if, if I may just go back a little bit to yeah. 101 about hormones and the voice. So I, all, if you think of a piano string, our vocal cords are very much like that. If they're long and thick, then the sound that comes out is deep. And uh, if they're short and thin, the sound that comes out is very high. So when you think about a little child's voice, those vocal cords, and they're the same in little boys and little girls, are very short and thin. But once we go through puberty, obviously, if you've been to middle school, you know, boys' voices change a whole octave where under the influence of estrogen, the vocal cords really don't thicken that much. They just kind of plump up and become more full and supple. And that's why a woman's voice is just about a third of an octave lower than um, a, uh, excuse me, than a child's. But what happens then is that estrogen during our menstrual cycle causes this lush mucus, thin, watery, exactly the same thing that happens in our cervical mucus. Uh, and it becomes, it just really helps with the undulating of the vocal cord muscle. In the second half of our menstrual cycle, under progesterone influence, 
the mucus, just like it does with the cervix, really thickens and becomes very viscous. And that's why uh, professional young singers have trouble maintaining their uh, harmonics and holding certain notes. They, they just can't do it in the second half of the menstrual cycle. Well, after menopause, when there's very little estrogen around, all the body sees is testosterone. So the testosterone starts to work on our vocal cords and they start to lengthen and thicken. And that's why we get that deepening of the voice. Without estrogen, our vocal cords also become dehydrated. And that's why we get that raspiness, um, like Lauren Bacall. It worked for her, right. but not for did, the did. Yes. Uh, and then that's also why we get the onset of early vocal fatigue. So as providers, the first thing for me is recognizing this. This is something that really I have had no education on. The question then is, is that can we or should we be treating these vocal changes in, in midlife? And, and if so, how do we? So in to put this in perspective, uh, the pitch, perceived pitch of our voice is called the fundamental frequency. And the difference between the follicular phase of our menstrual cycle and the luteal phase is about 3%. So most of us didn't ever realize we had any voice change when we were cycling. After menopause, the change can be about 7%. So again, so what if we get a little bit of deepening to our voice? The problem is, is for our patients who use their voice a lot or are elite voice professionals, voiceover artists, uh, opera singers, right. these women, audiences now are so, um, uh, they're so discriminating. And we've got these high level earbuds now where sound quality is so right. precise audiences can detect a pitch difference of 1%. Wow. So a 7% pitch difference can be career ending. So should we treat them? Absolutely. Can we treat them? We have a great protocol. First of all, we know that estrogen therapy basically helps all acoustic parameters in menopausal women. Uh, 73% of women will have almost a complete reversal of their vocal changes by the end of 12 months of therapy. For mm -hmm. most women, um, an estrogen is an estrogen is an estrogen. Nasal estrogen seems to work a little bit better in studies, but ugh, the taste is terrible, the aftertaste. So you can't keep the performers on it. Uh, oral estrogens, um, estradiol, the dose needs to be probably one milligram. Uh, if you're going to use a conjugated equine estrogen, it's the minimum dose would be 0 0.45. The estradiol patches are very good, but you need to start at a patch of 0 0.05 milligrams. And you really need to partner with a good ear, nose, and throat otorhinolaryngologist who can do the physical exams on these patients and make sure right. their vocal parameters and their structures are responding to therapy. But I will tell you this. These performers can tell you straight up without any testing, any exam, whether or not their vocal parameters are responding to estrogen therapy. They're that astute and in tune to their bodies. Now, is research being done on this, on voice changes in the menopause patients? And I, and I do think that, you know, you're right, that while there may be changes across the spectrum, there will be that elite group that really does notice a difference and it, and it impacts them. I have a radio host who's a patient of mine who's complained of this, and clearly it's related to, you know, where she is in her stage of life. So what research is there being done? So there was a lot of research back in the 1980s because of two French physicians, uh, Jean Arbatol and his wife, who was a gynecologist, Beatrice. And so we have a lot of data from the 1980s and 1990s, but then there's been this lag until about 2018. And then the research into menopause and the voice has really picked up. The most exciting, at least to me, is the new bridge to AI voice as a biomarker project led by Dr. Ben Susan in, and her collaborative group. It's it's just amazing. For instance, from the Mayo Clinic recently, they had a voice study where voice samples were used and then analyzed by AI. 
and they could detect plaque buildup in arteries uh, before anything clinically showed up. The same wow. thing with the voice to AI study, the researchers have found that in neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, if you, an if you let AI, artificial intelligence, analyze the voice, you can pick up those changes a decade before the patient will manifest motor signs of Parkinson's and six years before they'll start to manifest the uh, clinical uh, cognitive decline of Alzheimer's disease. As far as menopause, Dr. Ben Susan and I hope that we're able to use voice as a tool to predict menopause, especially for those young women that are caught off guard. You know, menopause can really occur from age 40 on up to age 60. So at 36, you don't wake up one morning and go, well, gosh, I'm gonna go through menopause at 40, so I need to have my children. I mean, being able to time your menopause when you're younger, that information may help you with your life trajectory. And then we also see a use for menopause and the voice as a biomarker for therapeutic interventions for those patients like your patient who may really benefit from being on estrogen therapy and may not otherwise. Fascinating. Thank you so much. And, and broadening our knowledge and really thinking about the fact that menopause is certainly more than hot flashes these days. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Thanks for your time.